of world history and battles. It's engineering books. It's physics books. This man wanted to know where his cannonballs would land, all right? He was much more than just sort of a lucky general. He was into the physics, the engineering, and the material science of war. And so he immediately summoned up the five-volume production of Laplace, read it through, cover to cover, called in Laplace, and said, sir, I have the exact quote here. Uh, hang on. Uh, should, uh, Napoleon asked him what role God played in the construction and regulation of the heavens. This is kind of like that's what Newton would ask, right? Laplace replies, sir, I had no need for that hypothesis. And so what concerns me now is, even if you're as brilliant as Newton, you reach a point where you start basking in the majesty of God, and then your discovery stops. It just stops. You're kind of no good anymore for advancing that frontier, waiting for somebody else to come behind you who doesn't have God on the brain, and who says, that's a really cool problem, I want to solve it. They come in and solve it. But look at the time delay. This was a hundred year time delay. And the math that's in perturbation theory is like crumbs for Newton. He could have come up with that. The guy invented calculus just on a dare, practically. When someone asked him, what, what, you know, you know, Ike, how come planets orbit in ellipses and not some other shape? And he couldn't answer that. He goes home for two months, comes back, out comes integral differential calculus because he needed that to answer that, to answer that question. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of mind we were dealing with with Newton. He could have gone there, but he didn't. He didn't. His religiosity stopped him. And so we're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so, regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is, science is a philosophy of discovery, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. I don't need to see whether, I don't need, if, have you discovered anything lately? If not, get out of the science classroom. But I'm not gonna say, don't teach this, because it's, it's real, it happened. So I don't want people to sweep it under the rug, because if you do, you're neglecting something fundamental that's going on in people's minds when they confront things they don't understand. And it happens to the greatest of the minds as it happens to everyone else, many, if not most other people in the public. So, let me... Several problems with Tyson's claims. This story may have never actually happened. The case for its historicity is somewhat weak as Laplace himself denied it and the earliest reports about the meeting are relatively late. It is simply false that Newton ceased from scientific exploration into this problem. He did develop a theory of perturbations. He failed to develop the proper theory primarily because he had the wrong tools. As one historian summarizes, success came for Newton's successors only with a new approach, different from any he had envisaged, algorithmic and global. Laplace had lots of help. As Barnes explains, note the mathematicians who worked on the problem of perturbations to planetary orbits. Before. Laplace. Clairaut, Euler, D'Alembert, and Lagrange. These are the greatest mathematicians of their age. Leonard Euler is arguably the greatest mathematician of all time. Read Euler, read Euler, he is the master of us all. That quote, incidentally, is from Laplace. Euler was a devout Christian and a Lutheran saint. Apparently, having God on the brain didn't prevent him, as it didn't prevent Newton, from working on this scientific problem. Newton, of course, was a mathematical genius. But we can hardly blame him for not being smarter than Clairaut, Euler, D'Alembert, Lagrange and Laplace. Combined. Laplace's theory is not quite accurate either, orbits of the solar system are chaotic over timescales of a few billion years. It's important to correct this type of misleading historical account because it is often used to argue against interpreting something like fine-tuning as evidence for a creator. Anyone that sees evidence for God is said to be a science stopper. Why does Tyson feel the need to inject historical misrepresentations at all into his otherwise excellent public lectures on the beauty majesty of nature and the scientific endeavor? I assume that Tyson didn't know the broader story but we should expect more thorough research from a scientist and public spokesperson.